Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So, I'm going to share a quote. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I'm sure many of us have heard this quote before. It is attributed to the Unitarian minister and transcendentalist Theodore Parker, thank you, and has been kept alive in popular memory partly by Martin Luther King Jr., maybe little well-known man, and uh, more recently by 44th US President Barack Obama, who had the quote woven into a rug in the Oval Office as a reminder. Now, I hope you'll humor me in a little bit of cynicism. I promise it's not aimless, hopefully, but a productive starting point. I'd like to humbly disagree with this idea. Um, maybe not the idea itself, but rather the idea, or maybe how we interpret this quote. Um, we seem to dwell on the idea that justice is inevitable, but I think the part of the statement that is more pressing is that the journey to justice is long. Um, so over the past two years or so with recent events, we've been hearing a lot of talk about how things are worse than they've been in a long time. Um, gusts of violence, extremism and egoism are glowing across the globe. Human lives are being snuffed daily and there's little time to process before the next act of senseless violence. And for different reasons, folks seem to want to return to some version of the recent or distant past, um, a time that supposedly humanity was great. I'm feeling a little confused about this, personally. I'm 24 years old, I haven't been around all that long. But in my lifetime and in reading about times before mine, I really struggle to recall true lasting moments of greatness in human history. Times that it would be desirable to return to or emulate today. And perhaps my perspective is impacted by some of the events that have marked my coming of age. I went to university in the fall of 2012, just as the Black Lives Matter movement was picking up steam. Earlier that year, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was on his way home from buying snacks at the store when he was fatally shot by a neighborhood vigilante. This vigilante, a member of Neighborhood Watch, had identified Trayvon as suspicious. He accosted him, and well, we all know how that ended. Earlier that, or a year earlier, I sat in my sister's apartment, she's right over there, um, as news broke of a terrorist attack at the government office quarters in Norway, um, in the capital city, Oslo. It was a hot summer's day in the middle of July. My parents and I were visiting her and we had the windows open to let the breeze pass through the ground floor apartment. As soon as the news broke, we shut the windows, drew the blinds, and my parents started to look at flights. Terrorist was a code word for a brown person, an immigrant, and we were stuck in a strange limbo state of feeling devastated over what had happened, but also very aware that we might be lumped into the category of perpetrator. About 40 minutes later, when the terrorists arrived at the youth camp for the Labour Party and opened fire on a group of politically engaged young people, he was suddenly labeled a lone wolf. At that moment, we knew he was what they call ethnically Norwegian. I'm quite certain that few white Norwegians started to draw their blinds and create escape plans because they shared certain social characteristics with the terrorist. But going even further back, the first major event that shook my understanding of my place in the world was the murder of a 15-year-old Ghanaian Norwegian boy called Benjamin Halmansen on January 26, 2001, in the Oslo neighborhood of Holmlia. Benjamin and a friend were standing outside a grocery store when two men exited a car and ran toward them. Benjamin tried to escape, but he was caught and stabbed to death by two men who were later found to be members of a neo-Nazi group. These are some of the big moments, the ones that made the news. Around the time of Benjamin's murder, I myself was experiencing the daily macro and microaggressions of being an immigrant kid of color in a predominantly white country. I recall being somewhere between the ages of six and seven when the concepts of racism and xenophobia were introduced into my vocabulary. These were the days when my school days began to be peppered by monkey chants and go back to Africa and unexpected bursts of violence that left me feeling angry, confused, but mostly sad. In the years since, I've become quite concerned with how kids and young people, particularly those whose identities fall outside the frames of so-called dominant cultures, are forced to grow up quickly. They grow up quickly because they learn early on about prejudice, what it means to be hated or feared, not based on your actions, but rather by default, to contend with unearned pain and try to make an easy peace with it, to see humanity in people who see none in you, to forgive people who later repent of these behaviors, either blaming youth or ignorance. I've been that kid. And I often wonder, what about the innocence of children who early on learn to look hate in the face and not let their hearts be hardened by it? 
Are our childhoods not sacred? Now, these events and experiences have led me to hold a healthy degree of skepticism about social change and how we so rarely manage to really create and maintain it, in a lasting sense anyway. My mother often quotes a certain biblical scripture, there's nothing new under the sun. And as a student of history, it's clear that global events and the popular attitudes that give rise to them very much exist in historical context and have deep social and cultural roots. I think that in order for us to become more effective change makers, we have to accept that we haven't quite managed to create a world that we can be proud of. And we have to address another problem, that we as human beings have this need to feel hopeful and happy about what we've achieved and that we often feel more concerned about the symbolism of this than of actually doing the hard work that is required to make the world better. One of my favorite writers, ta Coates, calls this a hope unearned. We place a lot of this hope on young people. The next generation is always gonna make things better. Young people are magic unicorns who by virtue of their youth are just more progressive and you know, poised for this task than the people who raised them and taught them how to see the world. Struggle becomes glamorized as a form of youthful rebellion, particularly to people whose lives would be okay if they really chose not to engage at all. And when it loses its glamour and it's time to grow up, they abandon the struggle and re-enter civilized society. Their egos may have grown, but little has actually changed in the world. And this is partly because we don't talk enough about the greatest truths about striving for freedom and justice. That as Nelson Mandela once said, it is a long, long walk. That being an activist or an ally is really not about self-aggrandizement, but about putting your body and your soul where your politics are. An uncomfortable process. And as a result, marginalized groups whose everyday lives and longevity depend on it are forced to bear the lifelong mantle of making the world better. Now obviously I'm speaking in generalisms to make a point. We have had moments that have changed things for the better. I wouldn't be standing here if we didn't. But again, these changes are not the result of fate, but of decisive action, of people who belong to long traditions of activism demanding changes, both in laws and in popular attitudes, bringing them into the consciousness of everyday people, as well as the political and economic elite. They have to disturb our understanding of the world and of progress as we know it. This is what the various branches of the mid-20th century US civil rights movements from the movements for rights for people of color to the women's movements were doing with their marches and protests. Their direct descendants are movements like Black Lives Matter and Danai Gurira's Love Our Girls. Tarana Burke with her Me Too movement showing that we have a ways to go yet when it comes to ending sexual violence. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. again has been so deeply remembered that many forget he was, his work about, um, toward raising consciousness about injustice made him one of the most reviled men in his country and distrusted by people around the world. A person who has been teaching me a lot about my own privilege is a Ghanaian graduate student by the name of Wunpini Fatimata Mohammed. She's from the Dagomba ethnic group in northern Ghana. And she challenges the idea that Ghanaian identity is synonymous with Akan or southern Ghanaian identity. And she encourages Akan Ghanaians like myself to acknowledge that we benefit from a cultural and political hegemony and advocates for creating a Ghanaian society where all ethnic groups are properly respected and represented. It's because of people like those I mentioned, Danai, Tarana, of course MLK, and Wunpini, that progress is made. They actively engage to sway the arc of the moral universe toward justice, understanding progress as a verb, present tense. We do it now. But recent events have also shown that under the veneer of progress, things remain pretty ugly. That doesn't mean the world is any worse than it's ever been. More likely than anything, it simply is what it's always been. The ills of the past simply reappear in new, perhaps, perhaps less overtly threatening forms. I return to that scripture so often quoted by my mother. There's nothing new under the sun. The mere passage of time does not naturally change popular attitudes, nor does the passing of laws. And the idea that we can sit idly by and expect progress to happen or engage superficially is unrealistic and worse yet, it's really quite irresponsible. So thank you for coming with me on that journey of, of doom and gloom. <laughs> um, but I wanna talk a little bit about what we can also do to become active, loving, relentless agents of change, because I know people in this room care about that. Um, we can create a context in which the arc of the moral universe does actively bend toward justice. But that requires us to be willing to do the hard, hard work that that entails. 
And not only idealistic young people, because we have that burden put on us a lot, but we need intergenerational social justice work that is intersectional in nature, that operates from the understanding that many of the ills we're working against are intersected from xenophobia to gender inequality to imperialism to a lack of regard for the environment. This means that children and young people from marginalized backgrounds cannot be expected to bear the burden of change. For those of us who are parents or one day um, aspire to be, whether we all have privileges in some form, we have to make sure that we explain to our children that they are not the default in any society where we belong to a dominant culture, that they are not more normal than anyone else, and that they don't have, that um, they don't have a right to exert any form of violence, physical or otherwise, because something is unfamiliar. We have to keep in mind that when we spare the innocence of any child, it often comes at the cost of that of another. I desperately want to feel hopeful, even though that may not come across. Um, I know many of my peers, particularly those whose identities fall outside the frames of so-called normalcy, who already feel as though they've done a lifetime worth of activist work, feel the same way. We want the movements of our time to be more than mere moments, trends people jump on and dump once the fad is over. We need there to be an understanding that our world has never in its history been great. That doesn't mean that we can't be great, but achieving this will require work. Introspective individual work, as well as intentional collaborative work. The kind of work that is uncomfortable, time consuming, and cuts into every sphere of society. That requires a deep understanding of history and the understanding that everything is political. Every single stance is political. People have, with the help of conventions, oriented all their solutions toward the easiest side of easy, but it is clear that we must hold to what is difficult. This quote by Rainer Maria Wilke, I think, describes how we often approach social change. We speak of systems enacting structural violence, but how often do we stop to think of ourselves as pieces of those systems? Imagine if each of us committed to doing the hard personal work of addressing our personal biases and behaviors. Didn't point fingers at abstract systems, but boldly acknowledged our stakes in them and did what was needed to dismantle them. I think then we might begin to knock on the door of greatness. And thank you for taking some time to listen to my, my ramblings of millennial dread. <laughs> um, I'd like to share a few verses of a song with you, if that's okay. Um, it's called Questions, and it's by a Nigerian French singer called Asha. Tell me how many women's childhood dreams come to pass. Tell me how many movies turn out real. There are so many questions, questions I like to ask, so you can understand exactly how I feel. Tell me how many people wish they were someone else, someone they think the world wants them to be. Tell me how many babies will be born just to die, leaving me with these questions asking why. How do people get so busy they don't find time to love? Was the truth behind why people go to war? Why is there so much religion and yet so little love? Will I ever get to know the truth someday? Where's the youth who's gonna dare? Where's the elder who really cares? Why do people believe things they know aren't true? When you look into the mirror, who do you see? Why do we have to grow to be wise? Thank you.